Chapter 10 covers cell reproduction, and fundamentally we're going to be talking about cell division, but not all kinds of cell division, specifically the type of cell division that starts with one cell, and when the cell goes through the whole process, the end product would be two cells, which are exactly the same as each other, and exactly the same as the cell that we started with. And so that's the kind of cell division we'll be talking about in chapter 10. The picture here is showing cell division of a sea urchin, starting with the fertilized egg and then, well, they don't show the fertilized egg, but this uh, first picture on the left shows the single cell, the, the fertilized egg that has already gotten most of the way through the first division. And you're seeing that the first, what we call, um, cytokinesis, separation of the one cell into two distinct cells. And that process continues. Each cell, each product cell, from a, a series of events of cell division becomes the initial cell for another round of events. So this is a cycle. And when each cell divides again and again and again, you end up with a multicellular embryo shown in the middle, and then those cells continue to divide and divide and divide until you have so many cells that you don't need a microscope to see it anymore. You can see the whole organism in the adult stage on the far right. So just a little overview. We will talk about this kind of cell division in prokaryotic cells. It goes by the name of binary fission. So for prokaryotic cells, that is the name that you would use for, for the cell division of a prokaryotic cell, like bacteria or archaeans. For eukaryotic cells, we refer to this kind of cell division as the cell cycle. And part of the cell cycle, although not the entirety of it, is something called mitosis. And so sometimes when we refer to this kind of cell division, we just say mitosis although mitosis is part of the larger process called the cell cycle. But it's pretty typical to use those terms interchangeably um, if we're not being too precise. Um, we talk a little bit about what causes cancer because cancer is a malfunction of the cell cycle in a multicellular organism. And we're also going to learn some terminology relating to chromosomes. So you probably remember the structure of a prokaryotic cell, at least the basic parts of the prokaryotic cell. They all have ribosomes, remember, that make, that build proteins. They all have a chromosome that is wound up in, in the cytosol or in the cytoplasm. And we usually call that region of the cytoplasm the nucleoid region. And they have a cell membrane, the plasma membrane, and they have the cell wall. And then you may remember there's some other parts that may or may not be present depending on the kind of bacteria, the kind of prokaryote. And this would also be true of the archaeans as well. So when a bacterial cell, or archaean as well, I put bacteria here, but when prokaryotic cells go through this kind of cell division, we refer to it as binary fission. So um, there is no sexual life cycle in bacteria. They do not produce eggs and sperm. And so the reproduction of the whole organism, since the whole organism is only one cell, the reproduction of the whole organism is simply the um, division of the cell and making two cells. And we say that this kind of reproduction is clonal because clones are identical, two things that are identical to each other. And so you start off with one cell, it goes through all these steps, you end up with two cells, but they're identical to each other, they're clones. So I use that word a lot in the lecture. The, um, basically the steps of binary fission are that the cell um, the bacterial chromosome is copied so that there are two. And then 
those two chromosomes go to opposite ends of the initial cell. The cell gets larger and then builds a new cell membrane and cell wall in the middle to separate what was one cell into two cells. And then at that point, each cell has one its copy of the chromosome. The structure called the septum, anytime you see the word septum in biology, it, it's not a very specific term. In this context, it means uh, it always means a structure that separates or divides. In this case, the septum is the building of the new of the cell membrane and the new cell wall to divide what was one cell into two cells. So this picture just shows what I was mentioning. The chromosome replicates and moves to opposite ends of the cell. And then the plasma membrane kind of pinches in the middle and creates two little compartments. And then the cell wall is built to, to permanently separate them. So that's the septum. It's pretty simple. The eukaryotic cells, cell division, um, the cell cycle kind of cell division, is also pretty straightforward. You're going to have the phase where the cell replicates its chromosomes. But eukaryotic cells don't have just one chromosome. They have many. The chromosomes are linear, although that itself is not a very important thing. But the, um, the fact that there are many chromosomes instead of just one complicates things a little bit. In humans, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. A pair, you know, is two. So 23 pairs would be a total of 46 chromosomes in every cell. And so those 46 chromosomes will replicate each one. Each of the 46 will replicate itself. And so that each daughter cell, we usually call them daughter cells, or sometimes I call them product cells, at the end of the cell division has 46 chromosomes. So each of the 46 chromosomes replicates itself, and then each cell, each daughter cell, gets a full genome of 46 chromosomes by the end of this. So what are chromosomes? Chromosomes are a double helix of DNA wrapped around histone proteins. And DNA wrapped around histone proteins, that material is called chromatin. In humans, the chromosomes are numbered from longest to shortest. So chromosome 1 is the longest. Chromosome 2, pretty close. Chromosome 3 is pretty close. But when you get into chromosome 4, 5, and 6, they start getting shorter. Um, and so by the time you get to chromosome 22, that's the shortest one. And so chromosomes number 1 through 22, you have two copies, two completely separate copies of chromosome 1. So that's what we call a pair, uh, two, two of the same, um, a pair. Two copies of chromosome two, which are a pair. Um, two copies of chromosome three, et cetera, all the way up to chromosome 22. So two copies of each of those chromosomes is 46 total chromosomes. So for chromosomes that are numbered one through 22, you have two each of each of those numbered chromosomes. So that's a total of 44 chromosomes. And then the 23rd pair of chromosomes is kind of named differently. I wish they had just named it the 23rd pair, but um, that's the one where you have the one called X. They don't give it a number and you have one called Y. Now, if you're a male, you have one X and one Y, so you really don't have a pair because X and Y are not the same. They're not copies. They're not identical. If you're a female, though, you do have a 23rd pair because you have two copies of X. So everybody has the 44, what we call autosomes, the numbered ones. 
And then you have, in addition to that, in each cell, you also have either an X and a Y, or you have 44 autosomes plus an X and an X. So I really wish they had just named these as numbers, but they didn't, so that's what we're stuck with. Um, so for each of these chromosomes, there's a double helix of DNA of a certain length. Like I said, chromosome one is the longest and it's wound around the histone proteins. And chromosome 22 is the shortest piece, and it's wound around histone proteins, but for each of those, you have two copies of them. The average human chromosome, and, and typically um, chromosome eight is often kind of named as kind of the average human chromosome in terms of length. And um, the average human chromosome is about 140 million base pairs. You remember that on DNA, it's a double helix, so it's actually two strands in that whenever you have an A on one side, you have a T on the other strand. Or if you have a C on one strand, you have a G on the other. That A and T is called a base pair. That C and G is called a base pair. So there's 140 million of those base pairs on the, on the length of an average human chromosome. So like I said, chromosomes are wound up into chromatin. The way that that works, this is not the greatest picture in the world, but you have the DNA double helix. In this picture, you're zoomed in quite a bit. We're looking very close up at the DNA double helix. But if you zoom out, you can see kind of this bracket right here. And they're saying, OK, take all of that. And that whole thing just represents this little bit. See this little square here? So this little bit is a double helix. And the double helix is wound around, you can see all these little squirrely things in the middle, that's a hist those are histone proteins. So they're shown like little corkscrews, pink and yellow and blue and green. So those are histone proteins. So the DNA is wound around the histone proteins. And that whole structure, the DNA is actually, you can't tell from this picture, but it's actually wound around and then wound around again around a ball of histones. We usually call it the histone octomer because there's actually eight histones in that ball. Anyway, the, um, that whole structure, the DNA wrapped twice around the ball of histone proteins, that's called a nucleosome. And sometimes when you zoom out of the nucleosome, if you go down, you can now see that we're, instead of just looking at one nucleosome, we zoom out and we can see a whole bunch of nucleosomes. This is typically referred to as beads on a string structure, beads on a string. Each nucleosome is like a bead on a necklace, beads on a string. And then that keeps wrapping around and coiling around, and we won't get too detailed into it, but it keeps coiling tighter and tighter until, if we keep zooming outward, when we're looking at it from quite a distance away, you can see, in this case, a fully, rep this is a replicated chromosome. So this, this, or duplicated chromosome, this would be a chromosome that's already gone through the replication process in a preparation for that cell division that we were talking about. Most of the time, chromosomes don't, aren't in the duplicated form. Only when, only the duplicated form when the cell is getting ready to divide. Only in preparation for cell division. Now you may think that cells are always dividing, but in fact they're not, because if they always were dividing, then you would keep getting bigger every, I think the cell cycle in human is something along a 24 hour time period. So every 24 hours you would double in size if your cells were still going through cell division. So most of your cells are no longer going through cell division. Um, the only time as an adult, really, um, at the point, at the age that you're, you are, um, most of your cells are in a resting state. They're alive, but they're not actively um, dividing. And the only time a cell does divide is if another cell dies and you need to replace it. So at this point, you're not shrinking because your cells are being replaced when necessary, but you're also not really growing or getting bigger at a certain at, by a certain age, most of your cells are in a resting state and not actively in a cell division state. 
in an embryo, like the sea urchin embryo that we saw, or a human embryo, the cells are quickly dividing and growing. The, the organism is growing because of that. But the chromosomes only replicate or duplicate and look like this shape here, only right before they, the cell divides. So um, that's a very special moment to capture that, uh, to photograph chromosomes when you see them in that appearance. All right, so what does this mean, replication? We are going to look at replication, the process, in detail, but that's in a later chapter. So all you have to think of right now is, okay, a chromosome is DNA. I'm going to draw a double helix, and I can only draw a ladder, so just pretend like that's DNA, you know, the double-stranded and pretend like it's wound around the histone proteins, okay? So this is a chromosome the way it looks most of the time, and we usually just call it a monad, or an unreplicated chromosome, a regular chromosome. You, um, we do say unreplicated, although that's kind of silly. It's just a chromosome. Now, when the cell is getting ready for a cell division, What's going to happen is the two strands of the DNA are going to separate and then the cell is going to make another copy of the missing strand to fill it in. Let me see if I can get a different color. Pink color. Okay, let's go blue here. So then the cell will make, ah oh, darn it. Trying to draw with a mouse is always terrible, but I think you guys can tell what I'm drawing. Now the replicated chromosome has one strand of red and one strand of blue and the other copy has one strand of red and one strand of blue. And the way that that looks, um, let me erase this all, the way that's going to look if we just look at it kind of the way it would look under the microscope, you would have the, the unreplicated chromosome, the monad, under the microscope just kind of looks like a a little stick. But after replication, you would see and I'm telling you, I bought a hundred dollar mouse and I'm still getting this silly issue when I'm doing my drawings. But a monad chromosome is just like one stick and a dyad chromosome, yeah, doing it faster doesn't make it better. But those, when those two red strands pull apart and the blue strand is made, there's still those two new chromosomes are held together in the middle. And that structure that I drew as kind of a dot in the middle is called the centromere. So when a chromosome is replicated, the two new chromosomes are held together in the, by the centromere. All right, and the centromere is this dot right here in the middle that I drew. And that holds those two chromosomes together. So when the, when the centromere is holding the two chromosomes together, and guys, you have to forgive me for this because I didn't make up the language. I'm just telling you how it is. When a chromosome is in the unreplicated form, when it's just, you know, this thing, that's a monad chromosome. And there are certain times in the cell's life when the chromosomes will always be monads. And then after the, when the cell is getting ready to divide, it replicates that chromosome, and then all of its chromosomes appear in the, what we call the dyad form. So the monad is the unreplicated chromosome, the dyad is, the, is a replicated chromosome, and it really is two chromosomes, but when it's held together, this is really important, when the two chromosomes that are identical are held together by that centromere, we refer to the whole thing as one dyad. And I'm sorry about that, but they didn't call me when they'd made that decision. So a replicated chromosome is really two chromosomes, but it's held together at the centromere, and we refer to that whole structure as one dyad chromosome. All right, so now you know. Now you know the, the deep, dark secret. This picture shows the same thing.
uh, on the left, and um, I know it's not on purpose that they also used um, red and blue. They used it a little differently than I did. But on the left, you see monad chromosomes. So this is a copy of chromosome 1, let's say, and this is another copy of chromosome 1. And let's say those would both be contained within the nucleus of a cell, of every cell of your body. The same thing with a copy of chromosome 2 and another copy of chromosome 2, and a copy of chromosome 3 and another copy of chromosome 3. So you have two copies in the monad form of every kind of chromosome, all, all the way up to 22. And, um, and, and at certain points in the cell cycle, at certain points, they appear in this single form. This is the normal form for a chromosome. The monad form really is the normal form for a chromosome. It's the most, it's how chromosomes usually are. The relationship of this copy of chromosome 1 on the far left and this copy of chromosome 1 next to it, the red and the blue, the relationship between them, the fact that they are the same kind of chromosome, we call that relationship, we say they're homologous to each other. They're not going to attach to each other. That's not what we're talking about. We're just saying that because there's two copies of chromosome 1, that those are what we call a homologous pair. All right, but they don't need to like connect to each other, and they don't. All right, now after replication happens, this is how the chromosomes would look. The blue chromosome replicated itself, and now you have a blue dyad chromosome of chromosome 1. And then you have a red dyad. They don't really have colors, but in this picture. And you have a red dyad that is chromosome 1. And we still say, you're going to hate this, we still say there's only two copies of chromosome <laughs> Oh, I know there's kind of four, but um, we have two dyad chromosomes. The chromosomes are still homologous to each other. They contain the same genes in the same order, and they are the same length of chromosomes. So, um, now, right now, when, the, when these two blue copies of this chromosome are held together by the centromere, right here, um, and that's the word I'm using, centromere, Kinetochore is actually referring to the green proteins that are on top of it, but the centromere is underneath this little green dot. So the centromere holds the um, two chromosomes together, and we don't call them, though, chromosomes because the whole thing is just one dyad, the blue dyad, for example. And so we refer to each of these chromosomes, we call them sister chromatids, or we say there's two chromatids that make up one dyad chromosome, and there's two red chromatids that make up one dyad chromosome. All right, so when they're replicated, when the chromosomes are replicated, you can see that there's kind of four copies of chromosome 1 in the cell, but when they're held together by the centromere, we don't count them as four. We count them as two dyads. All right, so you have to live with that. That's probably, you know, one of those things that if you can wrap your brain around the way the language is, things will make sense. And there's no use in fighting it because this is the way it is. Um, I probably would have... If they had asked me, I probably would have told them to come up with something else, but this is it. All right, so what are the phases of the cell cycle? You need to know the names of everything and what happens in each phase. So we have phase names and we have events. So you need to know the phase name, the events, and then you have to be able to put those in chronological order. Because it's a cycle, it means we start with something and end with fundamentally the same thing. And so typically where we start, um, even though it's a cycle, we typically consider uh, G1. G1 is the first phase, and G stands for gap, although I usually tell students to think of it as growth, but technically it means gap phase, and it's the first gap phase. G1 is the longest phase, and this is where the cell is getting bigger because...
if the cell is going to divide, it needs to get bigger first. It needs to replicate everything, including its chromosomes. But it needs to make more organelles. It needs to make more volume so that when it divides, the two daughter cells or the two product cells will be roughly, you know, they won't be quite as large as the original cell, but they will be more close to the size of the original cell. So the cell grows. There's the cell is making more of everything, more ribosomes, more membranes, more of everything, so that when it does divide, each daughter cell can get some of everything. Um, the second phase is called S phase. S stands for synthesis, which is not helpful at all. It's DNA synthesis specifically. Um, because G1, there's a lot of synthesis of lipids and proteins and such, but S phase is DNA synthesis. So that's when that replication from the last slide is happening. That's when the monad chromosomes replicate and become those dyad chromosomes. Now, let's think about a human cell going through the cell cycle. Uh, in G1, a human cell has uh, 46 monad form chromosomes, two copies of chromosome 1, separate, two copies of chromosome 2, two copies of chromosome 3. After S phase, once S phase is done, the cell still contains 46 chromosomes, but now the chromosomes are not monads, they're dyads. So the weight of DNA in that cell is now doubled, but the number of chromosomes is still counted as 46. I would encourage you though to use the, the word, the language 46 monad chromosomes in G1 or 46 unreplicated chromosomes in G1, and then in G2, 46 dyad chromosomes or 46 replicated chromosomes. I think that helps you mentally to keep track of that. Um, but technically, if I asked you how many chromosomes are in G1 and how many are in G2, and you said there's 46 in G1 and 46 in G2, that's correct. Because the, lang the way we use the language, a dyad chromosome counts as one chromosome. Um, so in G2, all the chromosomes will be in the dyad form. That's a rule because the DNA synthesis has been completed. The replication of the chromosomes has been completed. And, and G2 is the second gap phase. And still there's more growth, building of lipids and proteins and these kinds of things. All right. In terms of length of the phases, it, it actually goes kind of, it's kind of easy to remember. G1 is the longest. S phase is the second longest. G2 is the third longest, and mitosis is the shortest. Um, sometimes we separate a last phase cytokinesis. Sometimes cytokinesis is tagged on as the last event of mitosis. Either way, it's the very last event. All right. The G1S and G2 phases are called collectively referred to as interphase. All right. Um, and so collectively, when you add the, the length of G1 plus S plus G2, that ends up ma making up like 90% of the time that a cell is going through the cell cycle, about 90% of the actual time is spent in interphase. And it's not that interphase, nothing's happening. It's just under a microscope, you really can't see much going on in the cell in interphase. It's not visible. Um, using the kind of microscope that you would use um, in a student lab, for example. But when the cell gets to M phase, M stands for mitosis. And remember I told you that sometimes this whole thing is just called mitosis, although that's really kind of sloppy. But in M phase, the mitosis portion of the cell cycle, this is when you can actually see things happening if you look at, a, at cells under a microscope. <coughs> So it's kind of the action, you know, all the action is in mitosis that you can actually see. And mitosis really has to do with the, di the division of the nucleus. So this is the nuclear division, is mitosis. Cytokinesis is the cytoplasm division. So you have the nuclear division and the, cytopla the division of the cytoplasm, which is the rest of the cell parts, all right? So G1, S, G2, and we're not going to get more detailed than these descriptions here. 
G1 is growth phase, building more membranes, building more proteins, building more ribosomes. It's the longest phase. Replication of DNA is what happens during synthesis. So that's the, where the chromosomes go from being the in the monad form to being in the dyad form. And then in G2, it's kind of more of just what you saw in G1, just more building of new organelles and building of more everything to get ready for the all the action, which really comes in M phase and then cytokinesis. So typically what you see in pretty much every textbook is this chart, which I call, uh, is it a pie chart or is it like a clock? I'm not sure. But it's drawn um, in a, almost in a pie chart way to show you how much time is spent. And that's why I kind of see it as a clock as well. So whatever it takes, however much time it takes for the cell to get from the very beginning of the cycle to that same place in the next cycle, one revolution of the cell cycle, uh, whatever that amount is, and it does vary a bit in uh, depending on the type of cell and the species and such. But in humans, it's like, say, 20 to 24 hours. So it's almost like a clock clock. Um, in a sense. And, um, but anyway, the, the biggest piece of the pie, the most of the time is spent in G1. In G1, the chromosad, chromosomes are in the monad form. S phase, that's a pretty significant piece of the pie. And, and all three, G1, S, and G2 are all marked as interphase. That's correct. And then in S phase, that's where your chromosomes become in the dyad form. Uh, that's when that happens. And so by G2, all the chromosomes are in the dyad form. We don't, the number of chromosomes doesn't change technically, but the form of the chromosomes changes. And that's in preparation for the mitosis and the cytokinesis. All right, and you can see mitosis and cytokinesis are a pretty slim um, segment of the pie. Usually, if we're starting at the beginning of G1, we think of the cell that starts G1, we usually call it the parental cell, although that can be a little confusing. I'm not talking about, like, your parents. Like, no. I'm just saying that for this cycle, that cell that begins G1 is given that name parental cell. And at, by the end of the cycle, there will be two cells, and those cells are called daughters. So the parent had two daughters. Actually, the parent split in half and became the two daughters, but whatever. Um, but it doesn't have anything to do with like your parents. It's just that cell, it's called the parental cell when it's at the beginning of the, of the cell cycle. And by the end, it's called, a, there, are, there will be two product cells, which would be sometimes called daughter cells. Um, sometimes the starting cell, I've seen it maybe less likely or only in certain contexts occasionally called the mother cell and then the two daughter cells there's a there's a certain feminization of the language for whatever reason i don't know but anyway that's just what it, whenever you end with two daughter cells each of those daughter cells is only a daughter cell for that iteration of the cycle if those daughter cells then go into g1 and start dividing themselves then they are re named parental cells for the next iteration of the division. So this terminology is very relative to any one turn of the cycle. All right, so what happens during M phase, mitosis? You have karyokinesis. Karyokinesis means division of the nucleus. All right, that's division of the nucleus. And cytokinesis is division of the cytoplasm. And so division of the nucleus um, typically is divided into either four or five phases. Um, prophase, the way I learned it was prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase when I was in school. And then they, somewhere along the line, and I don't even know who they are, inserted and it became somewhat accepted except for old old professors like me really kind of hate it but they added in another one called pro metaphase i mean this is 
it's just humans attempt to divide a what is really a continuous process divide it into chunks so that we can study it and learn it have some chance of learning it um, so it's really more for our ability to remember it um, the cell doesn't draw these lines it, it is a series of events and it continues from the beginning of prophase to the end of telophase and the cell doesn't have these um, these different groupings but we, we do to try to help learn it so what you want to do as you're studying this is um, memorize under each of these phases so this is drawn in chronological order so prophase is first then prometaphase then metaphase then anaphase then telophase and then after all of that the very last step whether you consider it a sixth part of this or you consider it a separate phase it doesn't matter to me cytokinesis that's where the cell is like officially divided into two daughter cells what you want to do is um, memorize the events that go with each and um, anytime they say kinetochore you are welcome to replace that with the word centromere because I'm not going to use kinetochore and there's reasons for that I don't I didn't get a chance to argue with the uh, with the authors of your book but let's put centromere um, I'm not going to distinguish too much between that so in prophase that's when the chromosomes go from being just loose not loose DNA they go from just being beads on a string remember the beads on a string chromatin it that's when they really tighten up and you can actually see them under a microscope and by this point, remember, because prophase comes right after G2, the chromosomes are always going to be in the dyad form. So when they tighten up and you can actually see them well enough to be able to take a photograph, that's why when you see a photograph of chromosomes, they always look like a little, kind of a little X shape, um, because that's well, only when they've tightened up or we say condensed can we actually visualize them enough to photograph them. The nuclear envelope disappears. It disintegrates. It, it totally disappears. The nucleolus disappears. And what we call spindle fibers. Spindle fibers are made of, uh, or they are, microtubules. And there's a little area on either end of the cell called the centrosome. In this picture, it's up here and over here. And the centrosome is where spindle fibers sort of start and they sort of build. They, they're being constructed, synthesized, and they kind of eventually meet in the middle. And they connect to the centromeres of the chromosomes and they start pushing and pulling the chromosomes around all right and those microtubules when they're in this formation they're called the spindle so the spindle is this network of, of fibers sort of emanating from either end of the cell which then connects to the chromosomes and starts moving them around and by the time you get to metaphase, the chromosomes have lined up in, and it doesn't have to be a vertical alignment, although a lot of times in books they show it that way, because there is no up or down. You can rotate this cell any way you want, but the chromosomes line up more or less in a linear uh, arrangement in what we call the midline of the cell, or the equator of the cell, or usually we call it the metaphase plate of the cell but it's the equator or the midline right in the middle of the cell and the way they they align one fiber let's say over here from the blue side attaches to one sister chromatid and then a fiber from the other side attaches to the other sister chromatid so for each dyad there's a fiber a microtubule a spindle fiber attached to the chromatid on the left and the, to the chromatid on the right and those fibers are coming from opposite ends of the cell and so what's going to happen that's true for all of these what's going to happen is in the next stage anaphase those fibers are going to retract and pull 
the dyad chromosomes apart. So we say centromeres are broken because the two dyads are pulled apart. Excuse me, I said that wrong. The two sister chromatids are pulled apart. The one dyad is pulled apart. And so if you look at this picture, the metaphase picture, let me see if I can erase this. If you can look at the metaphase picture here, you count four dyad chromosomes in that drawing. So the number of chromosomes in that cell is four. In prometaphase it was four, but it was four dyads. I'll put a D for dyad. In anaphase, you have actually, if, you, if you're going to be correct, you have to count each of these monads. Because once a dyad is pulled apart, it is now referred to as two monads. So you have one, two, three, four monads moving towards the left, and you have one, two, three, four monads moving to the right. So this cell actually has eight chromosomes now, but they're now in the monad form. So four dyads in metaphase, the dyads are pulled apart, becomes eight monads in anaphase. It's just a matter of how, you're, how you have to count them. Um, but no DNA was, rep, was made in the middle of between metaphase and anaphase. It's just the, the rules for counting say that a dyad counts as one chromosome and a monad counts as one chromosome. So by telophase, what you have is this group of chromosomes that's moving to the right ends up bundling into a new nucleus. This group of chromosomes moving to the left is bundled into a new nucleus. And you have fundamentally a reversal of the events of prophase in that the chromosomes decondense, they sort of relax out again. The nuclear envelope reappears around each new nuclei, each of the new nuclei, I should say and the spindle fiber disappears. So in most ways, it's just the reverse of the prophase events. But at that point, what you have in telophase, what you actually have is one cell with two nuclei. And so to completely finish this off, there has to be a separation into two complete cells. And that fundamentally has to do with the plasma membrane separating the two cells in animal cells, a ring of actin forms like almost like a, a drawstring right around the middle and just squeezes until the two cells pinch apart. And that actin ring is called the cleavage furrow. In plant cells, the cell wall is rigid, so the cell has to build a new cell wall. So the cell builds a, what, what we call a cell plate, which is a new plasma membrane and then builds a new cell wall. So cell plate is the building of a new plasma membrane and then, right, and then a new cell wall. And you remember that cell wall is made of cellulose. Cell wall, a new cell wall. All right. All right, so here's a little more detail on cytokinesis. All right, there's a ring of actin that gets tighter and tighter and tighter until the two cells are now pulled, pinched apart, the cleavage furrow. In plants, you can't have that happen because, you know, that cell wall is too, too rigid. So some little vesicles line up in the middle. They come from the Golgi, like little vesicles. And that creates the cell plate, which is the new plasma membrane. Read it over here. And then cellulose is secreted in that space and makes the new cell wall. So, it's, you know, probably not too surprising. There has to be a way for all that to happen. And at that point, then, just for a moment, you have two daughter cells. But basically, if the, cell, if the organism is growing quickly, each of the daughter cells then starts G1 again, and we would rename it, instead of calling it a daughter cell, we rename it, each, each of them can be called a parental cell for the next division. Not Like I said, not all cells are actively dividing. So if a cell divides and then only once, and then goes into the resting stage, 
And then it doesn't have a name, it's just a, a regular cell. And you had some practice, so we're not going to do this in lecture, but you did have some practice looking at different slides and being able to identify the different stages of M phase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, I think. I don't think it's visually it's hard to distinguish prophase from prometaphase. So we usually just stick with prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then maybe some cytokinesis. So you're going to memorize all the phases, so G1, S, G2, prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, cytokinesis. So there's nine, and you have to know the, step, uh, the events that happen in each of those. Um, so you need to spend a little bit of time with that um, and practice that and be able to put them in chronological order. Um, so let's talk a little bit about cancer, because what cancer is, is a failure of the cell to control itself. So when a cell is dividing, if something goes amiss, if something goes wrong, the cell has some options. It can put on the brakes and stay in a certain phase longer than normal in order to buy some time to correct the problem. Or it can kill itself. And that's called apoptosis. Apoptosis, A-P-O-P-T-O-S-I-S. -S. So, that, I mean, that makes sense, right? Either the cell puts on the brakes, so to speak, and stays in the same phase for longer than it should in order to try to correct a problem, or if it realizes that it cannot correct the problem, what should happen is the cell should die, should kill itself, cell suicide, apoptosis. Uh, I think now we call it programmed cell death. Same thing. So the cell, the cell dies on purpose. So what you have here, um, in a normal cell, you have checkpoints. And checkpoints are, it's like quality control. So there's a checkpoint towards the end of G1, or sometimes called the G1S checkpoint, G1S, because it's right at that boundary when the cell is going out of G1 and into S phase in terms of events. The G1S checkpoint there's also a checkpoint at the end of G2 before the cell goes into M, so sometimes it's called G2M, but it's, it's close to that boundary. And then there's a checkpoint in M phase. So these are the main checkpoints. So there's three main checkpoints, G1S, G2M, and then one right in the middle of M. And what each of these does is there's certain events that should have happened by the time the cell gets to these points. And if the cell has not achieved those goals, I guess you could say. So for example, for the G1S checkpoint, it has to do with the size of the cell. If the cell hasn't grown enough, then the cell can wait and grow more until it's ready. Then it can move forward into S. Uh, for the G2S, a lot of that has to do with whether or not the DNA has finished replication. Is the cell ready to go into M phase? So G2 M, I think I said it wrong, G2M is the cell checking the, the status of the DNA. And then um, the replication. And then in the M phase, it has to do with did the spindle fibers attach one from the left side of the spindle to the left-handed sister chromatid and one from the right side of the spindle to the right side chromatid, if that connection on each chromosome has happened correctly. So these are just checkpoints, it's quality control. If the cell hasn't met those criteria, then the cell will um, stop, put on the brakes. And part of the brakes are um, the expression of proteins. Well, there's a whole series of events and we're not gonna get into um, the, the um, biochemical pathways of, of cancer, okay? But part of the way that the cell monitors it is through a series of proteins called cyclins. Um, 
And cyclins are expressed only at certain points. So for example, at the boundary between G1 and S phase, you can see there's a cyclin called cyclin E. So cyclin E is produced at high levels right at that point, and it has a, an important role in the checkpoint. All right, there's another um, cyclin, cyclin B, which is produced in the orange here at a high level right at the um, G2M and also cyclin A, G2M checkpoint. And so these proteins are only produced at the time when they're needed. You don't have to memorize um, which one is, is produced when, but cyclins, that's the name. They gave these proteins the name cyclin because they are involved with the cell cycle. So you just need to know that cyclins are part of the system that helps um, with, with quality control, with checking everything at the different checkpoints. If the cell needs to put on the brakes, then this, these proteins are part of that. If the, Once the cell is ready to move forward, then these proteins are part of that. So when you have a cell that does not have control at the checkpoints, so what if your cyclins are not functioning right? What if other things are not functioning right? That's when you get cancer. Or that's when you have um, the potential for cancer. Cancer is defined as an unrestrained, uncontrolled growth of cells. So you have, it really just starts as one cell. And that cell divides and becomes two cells. And those cells divide and becomes four. Every, every tumor starts off as just one cell that that loses control. So cancer is a disease that starts with just one cell gone bad. And once it loses control, remember that the daughter cells are identical to it. So you start with one bad cell, you have two, and then you have four, and then you have eight. And pretty quickly you can have a whole bunch, which is a tumor. All right. Um, most cancers, I guess the good news, I don't know if this, this is good news at all, but most cancers, you have to have very specific gene mutations to have a cancer that progresses to what you might call a stage four. So most cancers have this multi-step progression with each step correlating to a gene mutation. I guess the bad news is that once a cell starts to go bad, it's at a much higher risk for getting new mutations. So it uh, can be, um, uh, can be a, a, a process that starts off kind of slow and then can speed up in a sense because cells that are cancerous or cells that are what sometimes we call them precancerous are more prone to getting new mutations. There are also viruses that can either bring in mutated copies of genes or can themselves affect the genes that are in the cell. The virus can affect how the genes in the cell are being um, expressed. So, so there are viruses that are uh, that can initiate cancer. Um, one that you may be familiar with is um, HPV, um, but there's many others. Um, but so, um, so it's either just a mutation that happened in one cell, the normal way. There's actually about two-thirds of all cell mutations just happen as just an accident. It's not because you, um, you know, didn't eat organic food and got too much sun exposure. Most, they think, that, that about two-thirds of all mutations in the cell are just just mistakes. Um, but there are chemicals and radiation and things that can that cause about one third of all mutations. And, um, and then the viruses, um, they only cause certain types of cancer. So those are usually associated with certain types of cancer. And one of the genes, other than the cyclins, one of the genes that is associated with um, it's typically one of the steps in the progression of cancer is called p53. Normal p53, if you have DNA damage or any kind of abnormality, um, p53 usually comes in to stop, to put on the brakes. 
cell cycle arrest means stop. And then if the, if the problem can be fixed, then it helps with that. Or P53 initiates apoptosis, which is the program cell death, the, the cell suicide I was mentioning. So what if you have a mutation in a cell of the P53 gene? That means you, P53 is not doing what it normally does. That means that the cell cannot initiate apoptosis and the cell cannot fix the problem. So what can happen is then that cell starts dividing and getting going bad. So P53 mutations are uh, commonly found in um, lots of um, types of cancer. All right, so I give you a little bit of um, information about cancer, not too much, and that's on purpose. It's a very complicated topic. But make sure you know the names of all the phases and what happens in each phase and what order that those go in. And then a little bit of the terminology of chromosomes. What's a monad? What's a dyad? Just some, just some fundamentals on that.